Um, right before I got tenure, it became clear that ADH induction in a room was just one piece of a bigger thing. It shouldn't surprise you. It turned out there were a bunch of proteins that were all co-induced at the same time by anaerobic stress. And so before, native gel, SPS gel, and after. Uh, these are uh, five-hour <coughs> incorporation after a, a few days of anaerobiosis. This is actually S35 methionine. Uh, and then, of course, uh, some, uh, some film. And then the famous dripping film. And then the result. <laughs> I can remember when this result came dripping out of the, Marty Sachs was holding it, out of the dark room and with a big grin on his face. And I said to myself, I wish I had the savvy to say cell. But uh, it turned out to be in cell, and it was the highest visibility cover that I had at the right time to get tenure. And it took me from classical genetics to having a host of little spots of the gel, of which ADH1 and 2 were among them. And then for the next five years, we marched down every spot trying to figure out what it was. And if we had a big pile of cDNAs, of course, that were enriched, much like each shot, cDNAs would be enriched after each shot, uh, maybe even better. Similar to each shot, in fact, that big thing is a heat shot protein. Uh, and there are a group of, and we've got to know pretty many of them, pyruvate decarboxylase, um, heat shot, uh, A heat shot 90, sucrosynthase, Two of aldolase, two other stem glycolytic enzymes. Um, there were a special group, we now know there are transcription factors called transition proteins that came up really early and then went down. And uh, we never could get a handle on those. But we know more about them by me reading the literature. This did have a future. And so we began in my lab, our team began going after ADH. We especially went at ADH because we had all sorts of interesting things sunk into ADH. For example, a bunch of transposons that no one knew about. If we could get ADH, we could get anything that had been a mutagen of ADH and trap it and clone it, because that was a big deal to be able to get our genes. So um, this was, uh, for me, a big deal, this uh, anaerobic response, and it was in sound. And I got interviewed and everything. And, as you can see here in 1982, the interview was about anaerobic proteins, but that's not where I was, not really. I never did like physiology much, <laughs> not for myself, <laughs> just for other people. I was looking at this moon plant here, uh, this great lady, this is a model plant, and my focus was somewhere else, and it also was true that the Peacock Lab in Canberra Jim Peacock in particular, took up ADH as his gene, and he was going to take those cDNAs, and he was going to clone the cDNA first before I did. And I tried my best. I was in a horse race, and I knew it. And he actually cloned the damn thing before I did. And it's the first time I ever realized <laughs> that I could actually commit myself to a race and conceivably lose, and I did lose. And um, he's, he's great guy sent us the probe, and in two weeks, my team, this is mainly Bennett's and Hague at the time, uh, had pulled the gene out with all its, the various varieties of our genes, with all their various inserts. I want to talk about a mutant that we got from Germany, from Hans-Peter Dering, Peter Stardler's lab collaborator. It was just an ADH mutant that had what he thought was an ADH gene that he knew had a DS2 sunk into it. And DS2 is a special kind of um, dissociation element of the, AC, of the McClintock ACDS system. DS2's bright chromosomes when they jump some of the time. They have a special little tag on them that's unique. It's called plasma, uh, sequence on the purple or something like that, some German name. Uh, but it had its own tag, so it wasn't like all the other ACDS elements. I was looking at a little row of ADH1 2F11 homozygotes, walking down absently looking at the plants like I always did, running my fingers down the leaves, and I felt bumps. 
and I felt more bumps, tiny little bumps. All this would not be seen in the eye, only by the feet. This is a true story. And it turned out to be a teeny version of this, and it turned out to be not it, and it turned out to be DS2, and Sarah Haig found that, and so it wasn't until two years after this photo, and about pretty much two years after this, uh, that we published our first paper, Sarah Haig and I, on Nodded, and then she cloned Nodded um, in my lab using this allele, and then she went off and studied it. Meanwhile, we had sunk the new one element had been in, was the source of many of our mutations in ADH1. Many of them were regulatory. So once we had ADH1, we had mu1. And once we had mu1, we had a probe for the master element. But we didn't have a good system to study it, and there was a whole line of research in my lab involving doing excellent genetics on the mutator system that was very complicated. And I was blessed with Paul Comet and Damon Lish, both way more elegant geneticists than I am. And they simplified the system. They made something that had about seven different master elements into a line that only had one master element segregating and one reporter gene. Real simple. We called it the minimal line, and everything fell into place after we had that line. Before that, it was just a big mess. I'm not going to even go through, oh, and, and so uh, new wine was cloned, a copia-like element was cloned, Martinson uh, found out that um, you could use the new element to study somatically heritable switches uh, at the molecular level and study methylation patterns as they ran up the plant. Uh, Comet Lish and others, but especially Paul Comet and Damon Lish, uh, mastered the mastered the genetics of UDR and is in a great horse race with Ginny Walbert, but Ginny's not here. And Pat Schnabel, Pat's not here. And I can say without a doubt that unlike the first horse race I was in, I won the second horse race clearly over the finish line. And everyone agreed. But my community, my sweet nice genetics community got me together and made me agree that we all crossed at the same time. <laughs> this is a true statement. <laughs> Mage geneticists are really sweet. You can't win a horse race. Not really. <laughs> I didn't know that. It seemed to me, Peacock ran right over me. He <laughs> must not be a Mage He wasn't a Mage Um with Mew Killer, with Damon Lynch. Mu killer, I'll show you a picture of it. Mu killer is a little element that when it's with the master element um, and the reporter chain, and then you pop in mu killer, the activity of the whole transposon system turns off. Then you take mu killer out and keep growing, and it stays off. So it silences, and then you take it away, and like Frankenstein's monster, it stays heritably silenced <laughs> out of the control. Of course, that's epigenetic silencing. That's a good thing. We had a good system, and that's Damon Lish's work, and Woodhouse and others working with him, and that's a story. And I love Slim Diller's wonderful discovery of a circular intermediate with the new element, and it's still not understood how that plays into its mechanics. This is Damon. That's a new killer making the message from within a mu element that is a hairpin, and it initiates a silence and response through well-known RNA pathways. Um, having committed our, myself to the maze leaf through not, I sort of began on the simplest part of the leaf, the sheath, the ligule, and the blade. This is a leaf. Line right across it, and that's the ligule of the arc and the plate. I wanted to know how that line was created. We studied in detail how every cell divided into that line, how it grew, and how mutants disrupted it. We cloned all the mutants, the transcription factors. We even know, knew, as I'll show you in a minute, what tissue layer they acted in and who they told. And for the life of me, I have no idea how that line is drawn. 